Well, good morning again. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to step out of Colossians um, for a couple of weeks as we focus on certain aspects of the Christmas story as recorded in Scripture. Some of you parents can sigh relief. We're not going to be dealing with circumcision today. <laughs> But it's coming. <laughs> Gird up your loins. <laughs> Let's meditate upon the word of the Lord. Scripture calls us to delight in the Lord. Psalm 37, verses 4 through 8, and 39 through 40, we read as follows, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We're going to be talking about the heart today, so that's a good verse for us to be mindful of. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps and delivers them because they take refuge in him. Almighty Lord, we find great delight in your creation and the good things you have given us to enjoy, but we rarely spend time delighting in you. We tend to enjoy you when you give us what we want, but we become anxious, fretful, and angry when life is hard, and you seem unwilling to rescue us from the uncomfortable or painful circumstances we find ourselves in. We spend many days haunted by guilty fears over the sins that we have committed, forgetting the wounds that will forever scar the hands of your son, and that plead forgiveness for us every moment of every day. We fail to bear grief and shame patiently, because we forget that you alone are our stronghold in times of trouble, and you are working all things together for our good. Father, forgive us. We thank you for your radiant and beautiful Son who delighted in you above all else and perfectly committed all his ways to your sovereign will. We praise you that his flawless obedience is ours through faith, and we are forever reconciled to you as your beloved children. Instead of trying to escape discomfort, Jesus chose the pathway of excruciating pain in order to purchase us. In the tomb, he waited patiently for you, trusting in you for his salvation. You delivered him from death, making a showcase of his righteousness and your justice, investing him with great honor and glory. He took refuge in you, and you exalted his name above every other name. Thank you for uniting us to Christ and for loving us in the very same way. That you loved him. Father, cause us to find overwhelming delight in the salvation you have given us through Christ. Stir our weak souls to arise and shake off the fearful guilt we cling to with stubborn pride. Open our eyes more and more to see our great high priest crushed for us and now pleading for us before your throne. May we treasure his love and believe with all our hearts that nothing can separate us from it, not even the sin with which we continue to struggle. Give us such great confidence in the gospel that we run joyfully to you in the midst of our weakness to hear your pardoning voice and feel the ardent and passionate embrace of our true Father. Thank you for loving us so very, very much. And thank you for loving us first. We pray these things in the blessed name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to take some time to examine a passage in the Gospel of Luke that I find quite unique, and I trust that um, you will enjoy our time in this passage. Luke chapter 2, we're going to be reading. Our focus is going to be on Luke 2.19 as we consider what Mary did in response to all the things that have unfolded before her. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read beginning in verse 1 through verse 20. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. 
This was the first census taken while Cranius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Well, the focus is going to be on pondering Christmas. Our tendency is to be underwhelmed by the message of Christmas. We allow the world to carry us along in a tide of holiday malaise and obligations that tend to be more about merely observing Christmas rather than contemplating the true meaning of it. Sadly, the transformative story of Christmas is lost on me. At best, they're perhaps amazed, but after initial amazement wears off, most go on with their lives as if nothing of importance or consideration has happened at all. The drudgery of a mundane existence and the stress of the season overshadows the joyous message of Christmas, sadly, even among many who call themselves Christians. This is striking to me because it seems as if the world at least recognizes in some way that there is something unique about this particular holiday. Indeed, it seems that many of the redeemed even failed to achieve what was said of old Scrooge himself, that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. And are rather more like the leaguer Charlie Brown, who famously lamented to Linus that he doesn't really know what Christmas is all about, and then asked despondently, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Thankfully, Charlie had a good friend in Linus who took him to God's word, I don't think that cartoon would be written today, but I'm grateful that it was. Charlie, of course, is reminded of what Luke 2, 8 through 14 reads, as we just read, reminding him of the joyous and powerful message of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ, the one sent by God to save his people from their sins. Amidst the message of Christmas, there's one person whose response is unique and informative. A young girl, perhaps as young as 14, who was central in the most significant historical event to have occurred up to that point in history, took the time to reflect on the meaning of the events that transpired on that amazing and wonder-filled evening so long ago. Of course, I'm speaking of Mary. Significantly, Luke records in chapter 219 Mary's response, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. This brief insight into Mary's thoughts about the birth of her son, Jesus Christ, is informative and stands in stark contrast to the response of others who had been informed about the events of that evening by the shepherds, who upon hearing the proclamation of the angels made haste to see the newborn Savior and then reported what they had seen and been told about Jesus Christ. The shepherds ran, witnessed, reported, glorified, and praised God. Mary treasured and pondered while others merely wondered at what they had been told and then indifferently returned to their self-absorbed lives. The focus of this brief Christmas series, which I've entitled Pondering Christmas, will consider Mary's response to the birth of Jesus Christ, her son, and her Savior. 
We will look at what it was that Mary treasured and pondered and how that can inform our response to the amazing story of Christmas. So let's consider what it is that Mary did. We read in Scripture that she treasured and she pondered. Let's look at the Gospel of Luke here again. And let's begin with verse 15. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, or on the other hand, Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. This is what she did. She treasured. She considered what had taken place. Now, I want to say something real quick. I don't want anyone to think that because we're talking about Mary that we're worshiping Mary. We don't worship Mary. We shouldn't worship Mary. Mary was a sinner saved by grace. She is not the co redemptrix <laughs> along with Christ. You are not to pray to her, venerate her, or otherwise adore her in any manner. Indeed, she is blessed among women is what scripture says. And there is a place of honor for her in that regard. But that simply in the context of her relationship with Jesus Christ as his mother, she is no way connected to your salvation. All right? Please understand that. There are a lot of Christians who buy into the idea that somehow Mary is to be lifted up or exalted in some way where she's an equal with Jesus Christ. She would herself reject that. She would in Luke 147 refer to Christ as what? Her spirit rejoiced in God my Savior. And of course, when the shepherds came, they didn't run back to Bethlehem and tell everyone about Mary. They told them about what and who? The child, Jesus Christ. So let's not fall into the trap of venerating her or elevating her to a place of worship or making her anything other than she is in accordance with Scripture. That's something that we have to be careful about. But I think it's significant that we should take the time. Scripture records for us this important event, what Mary did, how Mary responded. Luke tells us that Mary did two things in response to the birth of Jesus. She treasured and, and, and pondered. So what did she treasure and ponder, and what do these words ultimately mean for us? It's interesting to me that many, many Theologians and historians believe that Mary was extremely young, as I said, probably around 14 or 15 years old. There are some who even say she may have been younger than that. You would think that a girl of that age would be consumed with all the things that were going on around her other than taking the time to engage in a reflection upon the events that had been transpiring and the things that were unfolding, both in the context of her um, immaculate conception and her ultimate birth of Jesus Christ. We know from Scripture that Mary indeed was a great theologian. She, in her Magnificat, quotes from the Old Testament. She knows the Word of God quite well. She had been well instructed. We don't know by whom. In the synagogue, most likely, she knew what the Old Testament foretold of the Messiah, and she would claim the promises of the prophets as her own, recognizing who Jesus Christ was. Granted, her knowledge was limited, and we see in Scripture her understanding growing as time would progress. But she did have a, a grasp of the significance of the events that were unfolding, and she took the time to consider them. So what we find here in verse 19 of Luke chapter 2 are not the mere sentimental musings of a silly girl caught up in a momentous occasion, but rather someone who was engaged in a mindful worship of Jesus Christ, who was contemplating the things that had transpired. So when Luke tells us, and Luke, of course, is one of great detail and precision, and so he tells us this important fact about Mary. We'll see something similar to this in verse 51, if you want to look over there real quick in Luke chapter 2. Again, this is, of course, several years after the birth of Christ. Verse 51 tells us that he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So what do we do when we treasure something? 
What is it that Luke is, is telling us about Mary? Well, we understand the word means ultimately to store up, keep something that's valued. A treasure is, is that thing that you place your affection and there's a value to it. There's a tension. It's something that you value above all else, whatever it is that you're treasuring. It could be a number of things. The word also can mean kept or preserved, treasured up in some translations. So Mary is taking the events that have unfolded. This would include, and we're going to take the time then to unpackage all the things that Mary would have understood. What is it that she would have been contemplating in that moment? What is it that she was treasuring or treasuring up in her heart? And what was it that she was pondering? We'll look at Matthew 121. We're going to look at Matthew 122 and 23. Understanding who Jesus is in the context of his coming as the Savior, the meaning of his name, the significance of his place as Savior. Also in Luke 20, or Matthew 21, 22, and 23, the idea of God with us, Emmanuel. These are all the things that Mary would have been contemplating. Things that had been revealed to her over the course of her pregnancy, and obviously as the shepherds came and revealed to her what the angels had told them. Let's keep this in mind. The value didn't come in Mary's response to what had happened. But rather, she was storing up what had happened because it was in and of itself valuable. It was the treasure. The unfolding of the events, the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of the angels, the proclamation of the shepherds, all of these things spoke to the fact that what was transpiring was in of itself of intrinsic extreme value. We're told in scripture that Jesus Christ is more precious than silver and gold. And of course, Mary was recognizing that. The concept of treasuring up is found throughout scripture. Psalm 119.11, your word I have treasured in my heart. What you value, you will treasure. You treasure it because you ultimately love it. Of course, Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, there will also be your what? Heart, heart of course. And the idea of the heart is significant. We'll talk about that in a moment. As a man thinks, so he is, Proverbs 23, 7. It's significant for us to understand that Mary's mind was focused upon Christ. Mary's mind was contemplating the significance of the events that were unfolding. And for us as the redeemed of God, we too should mimic her in her mindset to treasure what it is that Jesus Christ is for us. Do we really understand? Do we have a comprehension of the work and person of Jesus Christ? Have we placed great value in that above all things? Mary, of course, was doing that. Her heart was the repository for her treasure. The heart is the very essence of her being. So she was storing up her treasure in the vault of her very being, the very essence of who she was. And so we have to think about this in the context of where we are as we look at Christmas time. It's easy to get caught up in all the hustle and the bustle to get swept away with all the different things that are going on, to take our focus off of the true meaning of Christmas, to take our focus off of what it is that God has done for us in sending his son to be and dwell among us as we read in Colossians, as we know from Colossians, to take on the form of God in bodily form. Let's consider this issue of the heart. What is the heart? And how do we understand it here with Mary? Luke is precise in the language that he uses. Let's think about this. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. She recognized the value of them. So in Scripture, the heart means a great deal more than it does in our modern usage. We employ it as an expression for the affections, whereas the Bible takes it as including the whole inner person. For instance, we read, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is, in Proverbs 23, 7. And of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. So then the affections, as with us, but also the thoughts, purposes, our volitions, are all included in the word. 
And as one passage of scripture says, out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4, 23. It is the central reservoir, the central personality, the indivisible unit of thinking, willing, feeling, loving person, which we call ourselves or myself. It is the essence of who we are. So what Christ says is that where a man's treasure lies, and what we see here from Mary, not merely his affections will wrap around it, but his whole self will be, as it were, implicated and intertwined with it. That's what Luke is saying about Mary. She's just not thinking about the historical significance of the moment. She's not thinking about the fact that she is in that moment. She's contemplating the magnitude of the moment in the context of who the moment is about. She is treasuring that, and she's placing it into herself in a, such a way that it becomes intertwined into the very essence of who she is. That's significant for us. Mary treasured the value, valuable over the perishable. She, in faith, treasured the wealth which is perpetual and certain. That is Jesus Christ. Her focus was on Jesus Christ. She could have lauded herself. She could have said, I'm going to be a big deal. Think about that for a moment. What would you have done? Think of the book deals. Think of the movie. <laughs> Think of all the things that you can have. Think of who she would be amongst the, her own people. But that's not what she did. She took these things, she saw them in the context of the revelation of Scripture. She was a student of Scripture. She understood the prophecies. The shepherds had come to her. This is in that moment. They had reported to her and Joseph what the angels had said. And what did the angels say in verse 14? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. This is a momentous occasion. And Mary takes the time. In worship and in adoring wonder, not in just a passing amazement, but in the context of being overwhelmed by the magnitude of the message of Jesus Christ. As we will see, her mind harkens back to Matthew 121. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He is Emmanuel, God with us. All of the magnitude of that now is resting upon Mary and is filtering in through the grate of her mind and resting into her heart. As we all know, a person's real God is the thing that they count best and for which they work most earnestly. And we see that Mary here is overwhelmed in her heart by Jesus Christ already. It's interesting to me, the Son of God laying in her lap, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? isn't it? It's hard to contemplate the magnitude of that. But in her harm, she holds the Savior of God's people. Jew and Gentile alike. The angel had come to her and revealed to her what it was that would take place. How these things would unfold. She is told much more than Joseph was ever told. As young as she is, she handles all, this thing, all these things quite well, quite remarkably. But I like the idea that this issue comes to her in a way that rests upon her in terms of the significance of who Jesus Christ is. Now, of course, when we talk about the heart and treasuring things in our heart, the larger part of our lives... There are certain lines laid down by our circumstances, our trades, what we do, our jobs, our families, on which the focus of our thoughts and efforts must run. But the question is this, and this is the implication of what is being stated about Mary here, and I think for all of us, the question is this. When I am set free from the constraint of my daily job and duties and am at liberty to go as I like, where does my mind go? When the weight is taken off the sapling in the nursery garden, as one theologian said, which has been hung on it to turn it into a weeping tree, its elastic stem springs to the erect position. Where do I spring to when the weights are taken off? He goes on to say, the mother bird will hover over her nest. Where her treasure is, there is her maternal instinct. The needle, as he notes, follows the drawing of the pole star. 
The sunflower turns to the sun. Where do you go? The reins laid loose upon the horse's neck. It will do what? Go back to the barn. Hold her head up, Luke. She's running for the barn. You go home when you are left to yourselves. Where do you go? Where do you go? What's in your heart dictates where you go. We call ourselves Christians. For Mary, the significance of her conviction about who Jesus Christ is seen by the fact that she engages in this form of mindful worship. And to me, it's striking. I think it's difficult to consider the magnitude of what is taking place, how overwhelming this would have been to her mind. Yet in that moment, Luke records for us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Mary engages in heart worship. If her treasure was Christ, of course, her heart would turn to him, and it was. And that's the same for us. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, does Christ comfort and delight my soul? Does there come stealing into my mind often and more often the blessed contemplation of my wealth in Jesus Christ? Again, as this old theologian said, the river of our thoughts brings down in its continual, continual flow much mire and sand. Does it bring any gold? Do I think about Christ and find it to be my refreshment to do so? If I can tell you how often I have thought of God today, I have not thought of him often enough. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your thoughts, Mary's thoughts, were directed towards Jesus Christ. Now think about this for a moment. Let's consider, in contrast, what is taking place here. The shepherds told what they had seen and how they had been led to go to Bethlehem. And these verses state the effect produced by their story. The people that they told this to, as we see in verse 18, did what? Then all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. That's significant. Mary, of course, is contrasted with this group of people. Mary, on the other hand, thought on all the wonderful things that had happened in the context of the birth of Jesus Christ and to the shepherds as well. She kept them well in mind. She treasured them and putting them together, pondering them so as to see what they all meant for her and for all of mankind. The wonder of the many was a transient emotion in verse 18. This recollecting and brooding, if you will, of Mary was an abiding habit. The language, the grammar tells us in verse 18, look at this. And all who heard it wondered. The word also means curious. See, you got a bunch of shepherds running into town and they're telling people this thing just happened. Some might have thought they were crazy. Oh, that's curious. That, that, that's kind of wow. Wow, that's pretty neat. Wow, wow that's wonderful. And they go back to their regular job, whatever they were doing. They didn't run off to go see Mary and Joseph, did they? They didn't do anything. They wondered about it. They were curious about it. It's, it's a transient emotion. It's in the aorist tense, so it's passing in the context of what Luke is telling us here about them. All who heard it wondered. They were curious at the things which were told them by the shepherds. The, this, the distinction between the two means of thought, the two methods of thought, are drawn out by the use of the word but in verse 19. In verse 19, Luke contrasts Mary's response with the indifferent response of those to whom the shepherds had reported it. It's interesting to me, too, that the shepherds heard, believed, acted, sought, and testified. That's a sign of true conversion. That's a sign of people who have been, who have been brought to a different position, a different place, a different way of thinking. That is what the gospel does when it's proclaimed and the power of the Holy Spirit is with it and goes into the heart of a man and changes that person. That's regeneration. That's new life. This is not what the shepherds would have done. This is not what the people in verse 18 did. They heard all the things that the shepherds had seen. 
What they had witnessed, the angels, the, the visitation with Mary and Joseph, the, the viewing of the child, the understanding of the fulfillment of prophecy, of course, which would have probably been, been spoken of by and amongst them. But in verse 18, we see people who are indifferent. In verse 19, we see a person who is not indifferent to the message. Mary, on the other hand, treasured these things. Now, Luke also tells me that she's pondering. This is interesting. This is not a word that we often use. I doubt that many of you used it in a sentence this past week. But to ponder something is to engage in a, a weighing of the circumstances. So Mary here is pondering. She's weighing every circumstance relative to, relative to her son's birth. Related to the birth of Jesus Christ. What does it mean now that Jesus Christ is here? How will that impact? And so she began to store them all in her memory, into her heart. Not as mere sentiment. But as details regarding her son's purpose. That's really unique and really significant. As we look at these two groups of people, we have to be amazed by the fact that we see how God even works. The gospel either hardens the heart or it softens the heart. The sun that melts the clay or melts the wax hardens the clay. The shepherds come and report the good news in verse 18. It's the gospel message, basically. And people have a transient emotional response and go back to what they were doing. Mary, on the other hand, engages in worship. You have a contrast between, really, wonder and worship. Wonder is not worship. There's an element to wonder that can be part of worship, but if it's just wonder, curious amazement, that's really not it. Some people have that. A lot of churches are full of people like that, are they not? They're kind of curious. They put on a show. There's kind of a wonder about it. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's a, okay, that's great. That's good. But he's not seen as the Savior. Mary saw him for who he was. For who he was. Well, let's consider what Scripture tells us about Jesus Christ. Let's begin the process of examining what God's Word has to say to us about the work and person of Jesus Christ. Because this would have been part and parcel of what was taking place in Mary's mind. <laughs> Look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And over the next couple of Sundays, we're going to take the time to unpackage the significance of these verses. Now, now look, don't forget, keep your finger back in Luke 2.19. So Mary is hearing the report from the shepherds. Mary is hearing the report of what the angels have said. She has been involved in the birth of Jesus Christ, of course. She understands and remembers what she had been told by the angel Gabriel when she was told that this was going to take place. She is recollecting and recalling her visit with Elizabeth. She is understanding and comprehending all the things that are connected to the birth of Jesus Christ. That was the treasure. Jesus Christ is the treasure. So she's, she's, she's bringing that into her heart. She's thinking about it, and she's pondering, she's weighing all these things. This is what we ought to be doing as the redeemed of God, weighing and contemplating all that is connected with Jesus Christ. Do you do that? We must do that. Do you want to know what Christmas is all about? Does this season have any real significant meaning to you? Is it an opportunity for you to proclaim the gospel to the unregenerate members of your family whom you will have limited Connection to over the course of the year. Does the magnitude of the message promote you, prompt you to engage your heart with other people because you were so overwhelmed by the treasure of Jesus Christ? It's, it's significant. Think about it for a minute. So all of a sudden, Mary is seeing now in physical form God. Because in verse 23, it refers to him as Emmanuel, God with us. So now we have the fulfillment of the prophecies from Isaiah and from the Old Testament. Mary is recalling these things. 
She is, she is contemplating the wonderful treasure that is in Jesus Christ. Now, what is connected ultimately to Jesus Christ? Why does Jesus Christ come? Mary would have been thinking back upon the prophecies of the Old Testament and, and thinking about and contemplating the requirements of righteousness. She would have had an understanding that in the context of what was being sent to them through the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, is one who was coming to stand in her place before God. That his work, that his life would become hers and be credited to her account by God for her benefit. This is what's taking place in this moment with Mary. She steps back from it and she thinks and begins to process all the wonder that is in Jesus Christ. Prince of Peace, mighty God. These words would have been resonating with her. Do they resonate with you? What do you think about? What do you weigh? What do you treasure when you think about Christmas? Well, of course, Mary would have remembered most definitely. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She would have recalled. Now, let's go back to verse 18 in Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follow, follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. She's contemplating the magnitude of that. She's understanding that this child is different from any other child. That his conception, that his, his origination is uniquely his own. Verse 19, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She would have reflected upon the conversation that her and Joseph would have had about the very event in, as unfolded here for us in verse 20. Verse 21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Think about this for a minute. Mary is going to bear a son. She is told this. She understands this. She comprehends this. And his name is going to be Jesus, for he will do something very specific. He is not coming on a wing and a prayer. He is not arriving hoping that something might happen. God does not come wishing, wringing his hands that somehow somebody might accept him for who he is. No, he is definitively defined as the Savior. That's, his, that's the meaning of his name. And he will do something. It's not that he might do something. The verse tells us this, for he will save his people from their sins. This begs the question, who are his people? Who are his people? We could talk at length about that, but suffice it to say that God is sending his son to accomplish the redemption of his people, Jew and Gentile alike, referred to as the elect in scripture. And so the definition of his purpose is defined even at the beginning. There is no question about why he's coming at all. Never in the mind of God. There might be questions in the mind of men. But in the mind of God, his purpose is very specific. It's defined. And it will be accomplished. Indeed, it says, for he might save his people, he will save his people from their sins. He meets a desperate need. Mary, of course, is contemplating the fact that there is an issue about sin, of course, right? Right? There's a sin problem. And this sin separates God from man. She understands, as many of us fail to understand even today, that the issue is vertical. It's not horizontal. There is a problem that exists, and it's connected to Adam. And there needs to be a new Adam, and this new Adam is Jesus Christ. And all of these things are beginning to unfold in the mind of Mary. She's treasuring the significance and the magnitude of this. 
Luke 131 tells us this, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Even his name is full of meaning. The significance of this upon Mary, again, changes her thought process about herself, about other people. She treasures the thought of who Christ is. Luke 2.11 we're told this, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is what? Christ the Lord. Luke 2, 21. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. These are the things that Mary ultimately would grasp and understand and that she would treasure in her heart. Well, Next week, we'll move into the latter part of, of, of this section in Matthew, verses 22 and 23, and consider and contemplate what it is that this word Emmanuel means, God with us. But let's go back for a moment, and in conclusion, consider again what Luke is telling us about Mary. And examine your own hearts, and consider where your own heart and your mind is. But Mary, but Mary. Are you curious? Do you have a transient, emotional relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's nothing. You may have some element of wonder. You may have some sense of the fact that he was different in some respect. But do you know him as Mary knew him? as Savior, as Jesus. That's the significance. Mary would contemplate the fact that Jesus Christ was coming to accomplish a very specific purpose. That she too would be the beneficiary of his work, his righteousness, his faithfulness, his sinless perfection, his obedience to his Father. His willingness to take on the penalty of my sin, not his. Do you treasure that thought? Do you treasure what it is that Jesus Christ has done for you? I think for a moment about the fact that Mary would have been thinking too about all the rituals that were associated and foreshadowed the coming of the Messiah, the, the work of Jesus Christ, the, the, the temple. Now, now she's holding in her hands, in her arms, the bodily form of God. He, he's now accessible. He's not behind a veil. It's not hidden from view. I don't need a special person to have access. She's contemplating the fact that a person would be able to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. To know him. To be known by him. Do we treasure that? Is that worth treasuring? I would say that it is. And to ponder them in her heart. What are you weighing in your heart today? What is the most significant thing for you right now? I think in many ways the church is being tried by God. The refiner's fire is hot right now. And the church is being examined, kind of like the Israelites at Meribah. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to be pleased with the work of the Lord? Where is our heart? Where is our focus? Many things are taking place in our nation. There's unrest. There's uncertainty about the future. There seems to be no sense of fairness or equity or justice in the land. Where is our treasure? Where is our treasure? If you know Jesus Christ, my challenge to you today is to consider where your heart is in all these matters. Do you truly understand who Jesus Christ is? Do you truly understand why at Christmas we celebrate his coming? 
do we truly comprehend the magnitude and the meaning that God is with us? Do we truly understand and comprehend what Paul tells us in Colossians 2, 9 about the fact that Jesus is the fullness of all the deity in bodily form? Mary would have appreciated the magnitude of that. Not, and here's the thing. Do you know now that you know more than Mary did? Yeah. You know more about Jesus Christ than Mary ever did. In this context of what has been revealed to you in the fullness of God's word. So you have a lot of information to be overwhelmed by. You have a lot of things to treasure, don't you? That's wonderful. That's a magnificent thought for us, that God would give us such detailed information about him through all of his word. Mary didn't have the NASB. <laughs> it's doubtful that she had much of anything in writing. She would have memorized and been taught those things as a child in the synagogue. They were stored up in her heart. And so as she reflected upon them, they became a reality to her as she looked into the face of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. How do you live your life in the context of understanding that kind of treasure? How does that change how you respond to what happens? I think it would be significant. And as you ponder them, you begin to sense what it is that you're weighing in your own life as significant. I ask you every week, do you know Jesus Christ? There's two ways to understand that, of course. As a Christian, I want you to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he has done and what his purpose was in coming. The work and person of Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, then you need to know him from the standpoint that you are under judgment and you need someone else's righteousness in order to escape that. And that other person is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, you'll spend eternity separated from a loving father, but you'll know the reality of a condemning judge. All of that is spared us in Jesus Christ. Mary comprehended those things. She treasured them in her heart. Do you treasure Jesus Christ? I hope that you do. I hope that you'll think about Mary's response next week. As I said, we'll consider further what Matthew tells us about who he is and some other passages in Scripture that we can look to that help us understand why Jesus Christ ought to be our ultimate treasure. Let's pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this passage, this brief glimpse into the heart of Mary. We're told in Scripture that we're to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. and That's a reflection of the content of our heart. Our heart should desire to do that. Forgive us for not loving you as we ought. Forgive us for not treasuring you as we should. For not weighing and pondering all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. We appreciate the word that has been given to us here in Luke. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand it, that we would grasp the significance of its meaning, that it would change the way that we think about ourselves and about you and what you've done for us. May we leave here differently than we arrived, with a greater sense, a greater clarity of the treasure that we have in Jesus Christ. Forgive us for not treasuring him more. Forgive us for not pondering what he has done for us more frequently. Give us that desire, we pray, through the work of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with his presence. May our hearts be consumed with the love of the Savior, we pray in his name. Amen. God bless you and Merry Christmas.